When people talk about big tech nowadays, they usually don't mention Dell, but maybe they should. That's because the decades-old PC company has adapted and thrived amid massive change, and it isn't stopping anytime soon. I think all the last 37 years are just the pregame show for what's about to come. On this episode of Influencers, Chairman and CEO Michael Dell joins me to talk about his new book on the company's highs and lows, the economic risk posed by China, and how artificial intelligence will change our lives. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Michael Dell, CEO of Dell Technologies and author of the new book, Play Nice But Win. Michael, it's great to see you. Yeah, great to be with you, Andy. So I want to talk all about your book, but first I want to ask you about the business because Dell has really changed. You still do sell laptops, but you're a very different company now. Can you talk about what Dell does? So, you know, today Dell is the leading company in cloud and IT infrastructure. And so, you know, we are number one in pretty much all flavors of how you build the infrastructure for whatever it is you want to do in the world. So if you think about blockchain or, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles or AI driven biotech, at the center of all these things, you know, at the center of, uh, you know, the the increasingly connected uh, and intelligent world is an enormous amount of data, and all that data requires infrastructure and technology to manage it. And so we're the world's leading provider of all that, and and we still make PCs. So, uh, you know, uh, all all that together, yeah. First half of this year, we had 50 billion in revenues. Uh, last quarter, we grew 15%. So business is good. And the breakdown between sort of those legacy hardware business and the cloud business is roughly what? Well, uh, you know, as as we as we think about it, we have our infrastructure solutions, which includes cloud infrastructure and servers and storage and networks and and then, then we have our client systems, which is all the PCs and even some of the embedded edge computing. So it's a little hard to, to say, you know, kind of what's legacy and, and, and what's new. We have, as I said, number one positions in uh, some enormous businesses that have a like a 200 plus billion dollar TAM. And then we're investing heavily in some new areas to build some new multi-billion dollar businesses around multi-cloud, edge, uh, 5G, telco, and all the compute required to deal with this explosion of data and you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning that's required. Okay, we'll get back to the business a little bit more later, but I do wanna talk about the book. And the title, Play Nice But Win, I mean, that's kind of your MO, I guess, right? Is that where that comes from? Yeah, you know, as I talk about in the book, this is something that my parents told my two brothers and I, you know, uh, before we would go out and play ball in the street, and uh, it's one of my earliest childhood memories, and it kind of stuck with me as a general life philosophy as I watched them navigate their lives, and uh, you know, it's been something we've talked about at Dell, and uh, it's it's been a it's been a helpful helpful life philosophy, and turned out to be a a, a nice a nice title for the book. Yeah, I mean, the book is part memoir, part business thriller, part management advice. What made you write it now and present it this way? So, uh, you know, I'd written an earlier book back in the 90s, but uh, this one is much more personal. And obviously, a lot has happened in the last decade, you know, as uh, I bought the company back, you know, in in a in you know, the largest uh, go private ever in technology, and then did the largest merger acquisition ever in technology with EMC and VMware, and then took the company public again. 
a lot of people encouraged me to write a book about all of that. And I really wanted to share uh, in a real and raw way, you know, kind of what I was feeling during all of that and how it all actually went down. And I, you know, intermix the, the, the earlier stories of the company and my, and my childhood. Uh, so it's, it's basically, you know, everything, uh, you know, in, 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 in my life from, from the beginning to, to, to present. Yeah, let's talk about those early days a little bit. Growing up in Houston, your father was a doctor and you're a dentist, right? Is that right? Orthodontist. Orthodontist, right, there you go. And your mother was a broker, stockbroker, and you said entrepreneurship was the air my family breathed. So how vital was that family life to what you and the company became? You know, I think it was it was my upbringing and, and it was super helpful. You know, uh, my parents didn't talk about, uh, you know, what uh, sports teams were doing or anything like that. They were talking about, you know, the Federal Reserve and the price of oil and what was going on in the stock market and, you know, which companies were doing interesting, exciting things. That was what they talked about, you know, around the dinner table. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, that's 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 kind of what I grew up with, and I became fascinated, uh, you know, both with technology in its earliest forms, you know, with the electronic calculator, and then you know the microprocessor and the dawn of the of the microprocessor age with the early PCs, and also I was fascinated by business and business people, and particularly, you know, entrepreneurs who had sort of uh, gone outside the normal route and done something, uh, you know, different and, and, and amazing. And the, the, they were kind of, you know, her heroes to me. One of the most uh, emotional moments in the book is when you talk to your parents about dropping out of college. Um, you, you already had a pretty decent business going. And I remember talking to you about this decades ago when we first got to know each other. But back then, you told them you wanted to do this. And they cried, and then you cried, and you agreed to stay, but you ended up dropping out. What was it like making that leap into the unknown back then? Well, you know, the, the interesting thing about that whole moment, and I describe this in the book, is that if my parents hadn't really uh, forced me to stop, I don't think I would be here today, right? <laughs> because it was it was after I stopped that I really realized that this was something I was very passionate about. But you know, nobody wants to sit there and watch their mother cry, right? <laughs> and and uh, uh, it, it was a super emotional moment. And you know, later on, I figured out that you could actually uh, take a semester off from the University of Texas and go back later without any academic penalty. So that was one of the things I used uh, to convince my parents that, that it would be okay for me to, to, uh, to, to do this. The other thing I mentioned in the book is my mom was, was uh, pretty ill at the time and you know, uh, she, she probably didn't have the energy to, to actually uh, you know, argue with me about it. And, and uh, you know, the, all, all of that, Converge to, you know, uh, result in me starting the company right uh, in in my dorm room when I was nineteen. So, if aspiring entrepreneurs want to drop out of college or skip it altogether, what do you tell them? Is that a good idea? You know, I don't recommend it for generic advice, and I wouldn't sort of project my story onto other people uh, as a general proposition. You know, I think it's a very personal decision that that people have to make uh, on their own. For me, it seemed like a really obvious thing to do. I was super passionate about what I was doing, and you know, didn't seem like a big risk. I thought I could go right back to college if it didn't didn't work. You graduated from UT, as you said, and live in Austin, or didn't graduate. You dropped out. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's that's part. You went to UT, dropped out, live in Austin. Uh, we were talking about another famous uh, University of Texas person from your generation, which is Matthew McConaughey. And you guys know each other a little bit. Did you overlap in college at the same time? And what do you guys talk about? 
<laughs> no, we didn't really. Well, I was only there for like two semesters. So and and uh, you know, I I wasn't nearly as cool as as he is. Still, still, I'm not. Uh, I don't think I'll ever be. But but anyway, um, got to know him later on. And look, I mean, he loves Austin and Texas, and and so do I. And so. Uh, you know, we we talk about that. We talk about our kids. We hang out. We have a good time. You know, he's a he's quite a philosopher. If you haven't read his book, uh, and and uh, he's just a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a really cool book. Um, a lot of your book, which is a really cool book, focuses on Dell going public in the late '80s and then growing, and then a few decades later deciding to go private again. Talk first about your decision to take it public in 87, even after, as you say in the book, you received a cease and desist letter from IBM. And of that early period for the company, you write, we were simply growing too fast. That's something you almost never hear. What did you mean by that? Well, so, you know, in the first eight years of the company, we grew about 80% per year. And in the six years after that, we grew 60% per year. And so we were just outgrowing every single thing that, that we had, right? You know, people, systems, facilities, et cetera, capital structure. The only option for us, there were no SPACs, uh, you know, there, there wasn't late stage capital, banks, not an option. So the only way for us to finance the, the growth of the business, even though we were pretty capital efficient with our supply chain, was to go public. And we, we and we actually did a private placement in '87, and then in '88 is when, when we went public. You write about getting to know uh, people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs in the 1980s as your company began to grow. What did you learn from each one of them? Well, obviously, very different uh, people and. You know, I mean, uh, Steve uh, had, you know, this kind of uh, incredible idealism, uh, which turned out to be super powerful as as he pursued, you know, various various uh, uh, you know projects. Uh, I got to know him better, you know. Uh, it, you know when 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 he was at next and he was he was trying to get us to work with with his next operating system after they uh, decided to just be a software company and you know you have to admire the uh, the idealism really that that led to all of the uh, you know uh, incredible breakthroughs later on right with with the iPad and, and the iPhone you know you know many years later. Um, and you know, Bill. Bill obviously super smart, uh, unbelievably technical, and um, you know, uh, very tenacious and and uh, um, determined, and um, you know, persistent as a as a as a, as a business person. So uh, you know, we 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 had we had uh, a, a partnership with Microsoft. Still do in in a in a big way, um, and you know, it was it was fun to, to to see both of their trajectories. I mean, one of the things I learned from both of them was uh, something I, I didn't want, <laughs> which was, uh, you know, they they were both about ten years older than than uh, I am, and they weren't married, and uh, you know, to me. Uh, I, I didn't want to wake up and be 35 years old and, and not married. That would have been a very sad, uh, you know, uh, existence for me. So I wanted to get married and, and did uh, when, when when I was 24, um, fortunately, uh, and and that's 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 worked out great. Interesting. That's la that last point I'd never heard before. That's that's fascinating. Um, so let's move forward into the 2000s because. After the PC business had made Dell huge, there was concern about whether you could diversify beyond it. And I think your introduction includes a conversation we had in July 2012. Yeah, you're, was, you're, was, you're in there. You're you're in there a few times, Andy. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Come on, man. But you know, I was skeptical about whether you were really diversifying at all. Why was that time period 
uh, so important for the company, Michael? So, you know, around you kind of have to go back a little bit to the late 2000s, you know, kind of 2007, 2008, and it became clear that our business in its original form was in a way kind of fully amortized, right? You know, we needed to do some new things and we needed to do some new capabilities. So we started investing organically. We started acquiring other companies, building new capabilities in the data center and cloud and software and security. And, you know, of course, because these were investments, they weren't necessarily immediately producing uh, income. And so, you know, we 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 had you know, investors that were kind of watching this with interest and looking at it, and you know, they they, they basically didn't like it, right? You know, they, they, and and uh, at the same time, you had you know this incredible growth in smartphones and tablets, and kind of the narrative at the time was, gee, you know, uh, there's ne never going to be any more PCs. A PC's dead. All you need is a smartphone and a tablet. And uh, you know, you guys are going to go out of business. So, so all of that combined to make for you know not a great environment for our company. And at first, you know, it's pretty sad about that, right? <laughs> but uh, ultimately, there was a silver lining in this, in that you know the the market. I think, I, my view, mispriced the company and the opportunity. And so, I. Uh, took the opportunity to accelerate the transformation by you know, taking the company private. So we bought, you know, well, you obviously have to put it up for sale first and see if anybody else wants to pay more than, than you do. Um, but, you know, in partnership with Silver Lake, uh, bought all the shares back from the public shareholders at a price that gave them some of the potential benefit of our transformation, if we were successful, there's no guarantee we'd be successful without taking on any of the risks. So we did that and, you know, off we go. Yeah, so you you went private, then you did the $67 billion takeover of EMC, $50 billion of debt, um, you know, some high stakes there. And then ultimately you decided to go public again so to take us through that time period a little bit. Sure. So after we went private, we started investing heavily and doing all the things we wanted to do. And we effectively kind of reignited the entrepreneurial risk that had started the company. And we just started hiring thousands of engineers and, you know, thousands of salespeople and, and investing aggressively. And, um, it worked, <laughs> and uh, you know it was volatile. It, you know, if you looked at it quarter by quarter, you know you'd see tremendous volatility. But it was volatile in the upward direction, right? And so we were just making decisions super quickly. We were paying down debt really fast. In fact, uh, 18 months after the the go private, our net debt was basically zero, which was kind of amazing. <laughs> and uh, so the go private was very successful. We had a relationship with EMC and VMware that dated back to the early 2000s. And, you know, we'd even talked with them about a combination back in 2009. And so Egon Durbin from Silver Lake and I thought, wow, you know, if we could combine the number one in all areas of cloud and infrastructure, that would just be an amazing company and we'd be able to sell, you know, number one in everything all in one place to all these customers around the world. The only problem was we needed, you know, $67 billion and, and uh, we were private and, you know, need a lot of debt. Anyway, so I described in the book, we figured out how to do all that. And uh, in 2016, we did the biggest, you know, merger acquisition ever in, in tech, you know, and, and it was from a, a private company. We kind of did it, uh, you know, with, with, uh, we did it with a lot of debt, but also because we were buying a super valuable asset uh, that, that that we were putting on our balance sheet. Yeah, now you're public and the stock's been on fire. I think it's up, what, 160% since last March. Of that 20. sounds about right, yeah. Yeah. Not that you're keeping track or anything over there. Um, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you are. I am. Um, 
And you recently, and what, you have a market cap of about $80 billion almost right now, I think. Is that right? And, and so is there more upside, and what does the future look like for your company right now? So, yeah, enterprise value, I think, would be $110 billion or, or, or so, maybe a little more than that. We had a, a great uh, analyst day. Uh, wasn't a full day. Just the analyst meeting. Uh, people like them shorter now. Um, last week, and you can go to our investor relations website. We talked about our vision, our growth strategy, all the new areas we're investing in, and also uh, capital allocation. Uh, announced a $5 billion share buyback and a dividend uh, that's likely to be uh, formalized in, in the first quarter of next year. All that was really well received. I think as people look at the business and the VMware spin that we're doing, the distribution to our shareholders, all the capabilities we bought, and and also the, uh, you know, now, I guess uh, yesterday, uh, S&P uh, upgraded us two notches. Uh, which you don't often see. We had the same from one of the other rating agencies uh, a few days earlier. So, yeah, everything's coming together. I think there's plenty of growth opportunities given the size of the TAM and also the new businesses that we're investing into. You know, there are headwinds that all businesses are facing, though, right now, Michael. Obviously, COVID, supply chain, inflation. Can you talk about each one of those three? Uh, issues that you guys face. Sure. So let's uh, let's take them in the order you said. Um, COVID, you know, um, while there's been great, you know, uh, tragedy and and difficulty in the world, I also think it's amazing how much actually worked during the last eighteen months. And uh, technology was an you know played an enormous role in that. And I think that's actually an important part of what's happened with our company and with many companies is, you know, everybody sort of figured out that you need to be more digital and you need to be more hybrid, right? Don't think you're working in your office right now, right? Uh, and, and so um, all of that is to say uh, there's been a giant acceleration in the investments in technology across pretty much all aspects of society all over the world. And so that's been an enormous tailwind for us and super helpful. Um, and, and I think hybrid is, is here to stay. Um, on supply chain, you know, I think this has been a historical strength of ours. And, uh, you know, if you go back, you know, 20 or 30 years ago with the wave of outsourcing, I think some companies did this a little differently than others, where they just said, okay, I'm just gonna outsource everything and I don't really know how this works. I'm just gonna like give it all to another company and let them do it. Well, uh, when you get in these um, real supply crunches, you need to have an incredibly detailed understanding, not just of the key components, but actually of all the components and the entire supply chain. And that's something that we have had, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, 25 factories around the world. They're geographically distributed. You know, we've moved to more of a supply chain resilience approach in the last, you know, half decade or so. And we have a detailed understanding. And so I think we've, at least we've heard from our customers that we've done better than others relative to the supply chain challenges. And, and even though we're shipping more uh, machines than we've ever shipped before, um, you know, the demand is higher than, than ever before. So the challenges are, are still there for everyone. And then inflation, yeah, it's real. I mean, all the inflation you hear about in terms of component costs, shipping, et cetera, those are real costs that, you know, we're, we're incurring and, you know, are, are showing up throughout our system, but you know that's not really not really unique uh, unique to our business. Yeah, in the book you touch on uh, current excitement over five G and AI, though you note that their implementation must be quote humane unquote. What issue concerns you the most about the rise of AI? 
You know, I think the reskilling and retraining and how you create uh, opportunity for everyone. I mean, if you think about this from a from a uh, economic perspective, we have a lot of people that are not participating in the economy, uh, and yet we have these shortages for skills that are huge and a lot of retraining required. You know, 100 years ago, most people could do pretty much every job that there was, right? <laughs> and, you know, who could program robots and, uh, you know, you know, design, you know, spaceships and, uh, you know, do brain surgery, uh, come up with the algorithms and, and that sort of thing. Fewer and fewer people. And so I think creating uh, more skills you know, it, it, because the pace of change is only going to accelerate, it, it is is something that that you know, uh, I, I'm I'm certainly concerned about. Lots of people are are concerned about it. And I think for good reason. The pace of change is not going to slow down. You know, technology doesn't uh, sort of have an opinion on these things. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, you know, does, doesn't wake up in the morning and say, okay, well, let's wait until everybody you know has caught up. <laughs> Uh, you know, it just marches on. Yeah, it's just so true. You and I spoke last June, Michael, and you said the tech industry hadn't made enough progress on diversity. How would you assess what's happened in the sector and at Dell um, since then or just over the past year or so and, and the ways forward? Yeah, so, you know, we're making progress. I think many companies are, uh, but we've set out these moonshot goals. I mean, we want to have 50% of our workforce be female, right? And, uh, you know, we've set a goal to have 25% of our workforce here in the United States be black and Latinx, okay? Um, you know, uh, I think we can get there. And I think it's great that more and more companies are voluntarily setting these goals for themselves, measuring themselves. Uh, I think more there's more and more work around normative standards. So we're all sort of counting things the same way because there's a risk that, you know, everybody sort of has a different way of, of counting these things. But, um, you know, ESG broadly is, I think, uh, a, a great thing. I mean, you know, right now it doesn't seem our politicians can agree on much. Uh, but I think, you know, companies taking uh, specific efforts, you know, our moonshot goals for 2030 are just one example of those, but you can find tons of them for, from lots of companies. I think all of that is going to result in a lot of progress and actually is resulting in progress. I mean, we can see it, you know, in our, in our progress each year. I want to ask you about China. But that, that doesn't happen by itself, right? It's it's right. like there's no autopilot there. You have to actually go make it happen. Absolutely. I want to ask you about China, um, which is cracking down on their big tech companies while building up advanced manufacturing at the same time. The U.S. Senate passed a $250 billion bill in July that would invest in our tech competitiveness. What do you think or where do you think, excuse me, things stand between the U.S. and China in terms of technology? Well, it's kind of frosty, Andy. Uh, you know, <laughs> as, as the, 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 the relationship is a little bit, a little bit frosty at the moment. And uh, we could be heading toward a bipolar world. And, you know, that creates certainly challenges. Um, I think it's great that the U.S. is now starting to focus on some of these forward strategic industries. For decades, there's been zero uh, industrial policy. It was kind of a dirty phrase. You know, nobody wanted to talk about industrial policy. But when you have an incredible uh, nation like China deterministically investing in these strategic industries and the U.S. doing absolutely nothing, you know, and sort of getting hollowed out in areas like semiconductors, that's a real danger. And we're kind of seeing that. And so I think it's great that the U.S. is now focused on this. Um, hope it's not too late. I, 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 you know, like to see the same in the EU as well. And, you know, it's about, it's about time. 
And finally, Michael, what about the future for you? Um, you're still a young guy. I remember talking to you decades ago, you were a young guy. I can still call you a young guy. I, um, I was born young, so there you go. <laughs> you gotta stay young, that's the trick. Um, right, both of them. Um, what do you what do you see uh, for yourself going forward for Dell? What's what's sort of a roadmap here? Yeah, you know, it, this is incredibly fun, interesting, exciting for me. I'm learning, doing new things. You know, we get to do things that really matter in the world. And, uh, you know, I'd be bored, probably clinically depressed if somebody told me I couldn't do this. So uh, I'm just going to keep going and and having fun learning. And, and uh, look, I think the last uh, 37 years, you know, uh, have been incredibly exciting and interesting. But you mentioned 5G. When I think about all of these new things that are happening and this intelligent connected future with low latency networks and enormous amounts of data and AI, I think all the last 37 years are just a pregame show for what's about to come. So, you know, I want to be a part of that and don't want to miss out on that. All right, and we will be watching and following your moves. Michael Dell, CEO of Dell Technologies and author of the new book, Play Nice, But Win. Thanks for your time, Michael. Thank you, Andy, great to be with you. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, we'll see you next time.